come a tumbling down when the people of the Lord get down to pray. Oh, when the people of the Lord, oh, the people of the Lord, when the people of the Lord get down to pray, a door's going to swing open and the walls come a tumbling down when the people of the Lord get down to pray. Lord, listen to your children pray. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us praise. And he's going to take over and he's going to take control. He's going to move the mountains, make the waters roll. When the people of the Lord get down to pray. Oh, when the people of the Lord, oh, the people of the Lord, when the people of the Lord get down to pray, he's going to move the mountains, make the waters roll. When the people of the Lord get down to pray. study in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, 6, and 7, uh, to do a very, and, and to remind you, and I put this on your sheet tonight so that uh, you will know um, where, where my resources are coming from. Uh, William Barclay, in his little paperback edition of the New Testament commentary, the Daily Bible Study, is one of the best, again, I just keep plugging that, one of the best anybody could have, and then I'm doing also... Uh, the Interpreter's Bible, Volume 7 on Matthew. So a very quick review. You want to turn in your Bibles, I hope, to Matthew's Gospel, Chapter 5. Matthew's Gospel, Chapter 5. Uh, by our very quick, quick review, you will remember that we reviewed Chapter 4, and, and, and to get us into the context of where Jesus was and what was going on when Matthew began the Beatitudes, and at the very end of chapter 4, we talked about Jesus' ministry was teaching and preaching and healing. We talked about him beginning his ministry in the synagogues because in the synagogues, uh, 
noted people were invited to come, and in that synagogue is where the teaching took place. They were noted as the universities of their day. Uh, sacrifices took place in the temple, and normally teaching did not take place in the temple. I said normally because later on we're going to find Jesus teaching in the temple as if, as if to uh, poke his eye in the eye of the Pharisees and their religion and all their rules and regulations. So he started his ministry in the synagogues where, the people, where he had the, the opportunity to really reach the people. So remember the synagogue started the service, started off with prayers in the synagogue, and then the leader of the synagogue would select a scroll from a little closet where they had them back there, and uh, he would bring it out, and whoever was invited to read the scroll uh, might also be invited to give commentary on what they had read from the scroll. Not necessarily the person who read, but most often they did. Or someone else from the congregation would be asked to comment on the scriptures that had been read. And so there was no formal preacher. Or there, you know, there wasn't always a rabbi in the synagogue. There was a ruler of the synagogue or a president of the synagogue. So uh, in Luke's gospel, as you remember when Jesus, uh, Luke tells us that Jesus went into the synagogue and the leader of the synagogue reached back and pulled out the scroll of Isaiah. And Jesus read that part from Isaiah where he said, I have come to set the captives free, and that portion that we've already talked about. And then when Jesus got through reading from the scroll, he rolled it back up and handed it back to the leader of the synagogue. And then his commentary, his commentary on what he had just read from Isaiah, he said, this day, this scripture has been fulfilled in your ears. In other words, hello, I'm the one that Isaiah talked about. I'm the Messiah. Hello, I'm here. Here I am. And if you remember Luke's gospel, they tried to kill him. They tried to stone him, but he miraculously made his way out of that, and they did not kill or stone him at that time. His time had not yet come. And so this is the background that we had talked about uh, before we actually get into Beatitudes. Now, tonight, I'm going to really belabor the first Beatitude, and we won't get past the first Beatitude, but if I did this every Wednesday night, it'd take me five years to get through it, so I won't be here five years, so I'm going to pick up steam, and I'll have to start summarizing a lot of stuff, but I have wanted to in these first two or three times that we've talked about the Sermon on the Mount, I wanted to give you the historical background, which I've done. I wanted to get you into the context, which we've done. And I wanted you to pay attention specifically to some words. And I'm trying to teach you how blessed it is, how blessed, how blessed I have been to have been uh, privileged of God to be his preacher for these 40 years or so. And, and how that I've been able to go to university and to seminary and to get paid by my church to study the Word of God. Boy, where do I get paid to study the Word of God? I mean, you know, how cool is that? That is really cool. And so uh, I've tried to bring some of the knowledge that I have learned to you because you, most of you, have not had the privilege to go off and study like that at seminary or someplace. And so I want to show you I'm trying to show you just how important the original language was and is that the New Testament was written in, the Koine Greek, uh, and tonight I'll be talking about some of the Aramaic and the Hebrew that Jesus and his disciples spoke, but just so that you get an idea about word study. And then once we do this, and as we move along with this study of the Sermon on the Mount, you can take your Bible dictionaries. I hope you got one at home. I'll make some other recommendations for references for you. And you can look up a lot of these words and, and really get a deeper understanding of exactly what God's trying to teach us through the written word that we have before us. So tonight, let's do that. I'm going to just read again uh, verses 1 through 3 from chapter 5. Now, when he... That is, Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them 
saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, on your study sheet that we handed out, I hope everybody's got one. Mr. Steele, did you get one of these? Okay, all right. Uh, I, I wanted to point out to you Barclay in that little commentary I showed you. He points out two things that's very important for us to understand before we dive headfirst into the Beatitudes themselves. How many of you tonight are reading from a King James Bible? One, two, three. All right. <coughs> Pam, you got a King James? All right, even the new King James. Okay, so oh, you're over the passage, right? Mm -hmm. Do you notice that word for, F-O-R? It's italicized. Is it not? Is yours italicized? If you've got the old original King James, which is called the authorized version, you will notice that the word for, um, R, I'm sorry, R, yes. the word R, R is R. italicized, right? Yes. So what that means, and all the words that's in your old King James or new King James, every word that you see that is italicized in the print, what that means is that word was not in the original language in which the New Testament was written. And so there wasn't a corresponding Greek word or Aramaic or Hebrew word that would fit what the translators were trying to say into English. And so they added that word or those words in other places to give us a, a, a clearer, better understanding of what the writer of the gospel was trying to say to us. And so in in, in, this, in all the Beatitudes, blessed are, the, the verb are, and now remember, English is important, and don't get mad at me like one of my deacons did and stomp out, uh, you know, at one church because I was trying to teach you a little bit about the verbs. Uh, the, the verb is not in here uh, because in the language that Jesus and his disciples spoke, they spoke Aramaic and Hebrew, uh, there was no need for that verb in the Beatitudes when Jesus spoke these, th these words because there is an idiomatic uh, phrase uh, in, in the Hebrew and in the Aramaic. Uh, and, and I put that in all your things I gave to you. So the word there, <clears throat> blessed, is, is ashir in, in the Hebrew. And that word was used both in the Hebrew and the Aramaic as a common uh, expression of an exclamation. Now, y'all all know what an exclamation point is. And some of you were here years ago when I supplied, a long time ago, when I supplied the pulpit for Brother David, and I did that sermon about behold. Does anybody, Pam, do you remember that? Behold. And that, that's really just an exclamation point in the original. I mean, there's a word for that, but it, what it means is, you know, pay attention. Hello, I mean, you know, uh, Sonny Bud. <laughs> so anyway, these are exclamations, and, and there, there's a phrase, and, and that, that Hebrew phrase was, Oh, the blessedness of the man, and, and oh, the blessedness of. So in, in the English, we have got blessed are the poor in spirit. But in the original language, Jesus would say, oh, the blessedness of. That's the same word that's used in Psalm 1-1, where the psalmist said, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful. Oh, boy, I'd love to chase that rabbit. Let me chase that rabbit real quick. i got time to chase one rabbit tonight. I did this uh, one time. You know, yeah, Psalm 1-1. One, one. I, I, this is a rabbit chase. I'll get right back to the verb use and all that in just a minute. Blessed is the man who does not walk uh, in the way of sinners, who, do, who's not, who does not stand, who does not sit, right? So there's three things in, in Psalm 1-1. One, one. Blessed is the man who does not walk, and blessed is the man who does not stand, and blessed is the man who does not sit. And I told my Sunday school class one time when I was teaching this, I said, you know, years ago, when I was nothing but a pure heathen and a drunk, 
and I was I was a sorry no good sinner years ago. Uh, my younger brother got an airplane pilot's license to, to fly a private airplane, and at that time I was in some pretty high cotton, so we rented an airport uh, airplane out here at the airport, and we flew to New Orleans with a bunch of buddies, and we parted down on on Sin City Street. What's the name of that street down in New Orleans? Bourbon, Bourbon Street. Thank you. See, y'all been there too, haven't you? <laughs> All right. So, I, and I talked to those, you know, I was telling my Sunday school class about this and how we were strutting down Bourbon Street and there was one of those particular ladies out there, you know, kind of scantily dressed and she would say, hey, big boy, come here, let me talk to you. So, I was walking down the sidewalk and then I stopped and I stood to listen to the presentation. And she said, y'all need to just step inside and take a gander, take a look. And so we did, and there we are standing, and when we were nothing but absolute sinners, we thought we liked what we saw, so we sat down and proceeded to get ourselves messed up. So as, that's a perfect <laughs> picture of that psalmist when he says, blessed is the man who does not walk and who does not stand, and who does not sit. So, you know, keep on walking with the blinders on, but walk with Christian people and not Satan's people. All right, that's the rabbit chase. Let's go back to what we're talking about. So, oh, the blessedness of the man. Oh, the blessedness of the poor in spirit. So, the importance of understanding this uh, means that the, the Beatitudes, and I really want you to pick up on this. I mean, I really want to hammer this home. The Beatitudes are not some pious hopes of what's going to happen someday, way out yonder in the sweet by and by. You know, Mr. Steele, when you talk about when the roll is called up yonder, the, these Beatitudes are not way out yonder when, when we are going to fly off to heaven. They're not for that. They are, they're not pie-in-the-sky dreams or hopes. They are very strong, very strong congratulations of what is actual this very instant. That's important that you grasp this idea. The blessedness that Jesus pronounced upon Christians is not postponed to some future glorious heavenly event. It's the here and it's the now. It exists today, this very second. It exists. So please understand it's not some exalted state way out yonder that Christians will eventually enter into the Christian has already entered into it if he's one of the ones that Jesus is calling blessed or to be congratulated or of the blessedness of. In Barclay, I put a direct quote from him in there. The Beatitudes in effect say, Oh, the bliss of being a Christian. Oh, the joy of following Christ. Oh, the sheer happiness of knowing Jesus Christ as Master, Savior, and Lord. The very grammatical form of the original language, the grammar itself in the original language, is the statement of this joyous thrill and radiant gladness of the Christian life. So in the face of the Beatitudes, as we study through these Beatitudes, we will not have any long-faced, gloomy, gripey Christians. You can't. It's an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. So when we are truly what Jesus is describing in the Beatitudes, we are happy, blessed people. And it's in the here and now, right now. So let's talk about this other word, blessed. This is the Greek word makarios. <clears throat> this Greek word had its origin, its etymology. Y'all know that big old fancy word, etymology, that just means the study of the history of a word, where did it come from, what was its origin, how did it progress to get where it's at today, that's etymology. So this word in the Greek, makarios, uh, it had its origin on the islands of Cyprus, and it, it literally means the happy isle. And so people who lived on Cyprus, they thought that was the most beautiful place on earth. They called it paradise here on earth. And they thought that island contained everything of beauty, everything any person could ever want or need. In other words, they told everybody, you don't have to leave the island ever. You can live here forever and find anything and everything you always need. 
any happiness, any joy, whatever, all your stuff you need to eat, I mean, everything, it's right here. And, and they really taught that, and that's where that word came from. So they talked about it being the picture of complete, perfect happiness if you lived on the island of Crete. So that word, macarius, then, describes the joy which has its secret within itself. A joy that is serene, self-contained, untouchable, completely independent of the normal vicissitudes of life. Now, you know that big word, vicissitudes. I wish Barry Roberts was here. He was my uh, patsy when I pastored First Baptist St. Elmo. I would say, and I made this up with him, you know, we had an agreement before, so that I wasn't just embarrassing him in public. And Barry Roberts, if you're watching my Facebook live feed, son, you need to be here. So, <laughs> so Barry Roberts <clears throat> was my guy. And when I use a big word like that, like vicissitudes, I say, now, Barry, I, I know that you know what this word means, but we got to help everybody else. So I say, now, Barry, you know that it means the ups and downs in life, and particularly the downs of life. That's what that word vicissitudes means, the ups and downs of life, with a lot of emphasis on the downs. And so... <laughs> What the writer here is saying, what Matthew is saying in the words that he chose, in the grammar that he chose, he is saying that makarios, makarios in the Greek, is a type of joy or happiness uh, that totally escapes the ups and downs of life. And he, and, and Barclay compares this word to the English word happiness. Now, you know, we can talk about being happy, uh, and, and you know, my wife says, you make me so happy. I say, no, honey, I can't make you do anything. I can't make anybody happy. Only you can make yourself happy. I can't make you or anybody else happy. That comes from within. It doesn't come from external. Now, there are some external stuff that might make you happy. I mean, when, when Carol and I go out to the restaurant to eat and the waitress or waiter says, uh, what else can we get for you? My standard answer is, well, you can bring us a sack full of money and a few kind words. <laughs> they all say, well, I give you the kind words, but I can't help you on a sack full of money. And so if I had a sack full of money, that would bring me some of earthly joy and happiness, right? But if, so, if my house burned down and all my money burned up, then I'd be sad. It could be taken away from me. This word that we're using here is a word that cannot be taken, the joy, the happiness, the blessing cannot be taken away. It is somebody that no matter, Jesus is talking about a disciple of his who no matter what happens to them, nobody can rob them of their joy. And I even put that in your notes, John 16, 22, when Jesus said, no one will take your joy from you. No one. Because that's the kind of joy that even death and grief can't rob you of. Still inside, way down deep inside, even when death and grief and evil and whatever else comes our way, way down deep inside, there's something we own and possess that the devil can't get to and the world can't take away from us. It's the joy that Jesus Christ gives to every one of us who turn our lives completely over to him, who make him Lord as well as Savior. See, there's a lot of folks that want Jesus to be their Savior, but there's very few folks who want Jesus to be their Lord. Very few. There's a big difference there. And so this beatitude and all beatitudes are talking about those who want Jesus to be Lord of their very life. <clears throat> so uh, to be congratulated, oh, the blessedness of the... Macarius, the, the happy person, the, the, the joyful person. And then <clears throat> Matthew adds, <clears throat> who is poor in spirit. Who is poor. Oh, the blessedness of the person who is poor in spirit. Now, in the original Greek, there are two words for poor, and I put them into your word study sheet. Patokos, the Greek has two words, panes and patokos. Panes describes the working man, the man who makes a living with his hands, who doesn't have anything extra, but he's not a pauper either. He's not destitute. I hope you understand that word destitute. We'll talk about that in just a second. So the, the Panes man, he's poor. He doesn't have a huge bank account. He gets by and you this from payday to payday, like most of us know about. 
And he doesn't have a lot of excess, but he's not a pauper. He's not homeless. He's not uh, destitute at all. I mean, if he was destitute, he wouldn't have a place to live, wouldn't have any clothes to wear, any food to eat, but he's not. He's just a poor man. That's the first understanding of poor in the Greek. The second, but that's not the word that Matthew chooses to use. Matthew uses the word patokos. Patokos. I never could say that word in Greek class. Patokos. This describes the person who has nothing at all, who is abjectly and completely poverty stricken to the point of being destitute. This word describes the person who is homeless, who may not, the only thing they may own would be a, the clothes on their back, and they may not have much clothes on their back. They don't have any food for tomorrow or for the night's supper. They are absolutely destitute. They are poor. Now, the word, the Hebrew word for this, now remember, Matthew wrote it in Koine Greek, in the original uh, manuscript. But Jesus and his disciples again spoke Aramaic, and they spoke Hebrew. So the Hebrew word uh, for this word poor, I'll give you two of those. <clears throat> they were spelled A-N-I, an I, or so then I give you the etymology, the, the history of this, these two words. Number one, the words originally simply meant a poor person, just poor. And then that kind of evolved to mean because that person was poor, they didn't have any influence on anybody. They had no power. They didn't have any prestige. They didn't have any help in any form. They were poor and without the ability to influence anybody or to hold power over anybody, the poor person. And then thirdly, because they didn't have any influence or any power, <coughs> they were downtrodden and they were oppressed by everybody they came in contact with. Everybody took advantage of them. They were poor, they were destitute, and they were being abused by the society in which they lived. Oh, how modern is the Bible. How many poor people, as I'm describing by the etymology of these words, live in America today, live in the world today? And then finally, number four, this word, the, the final end of it was, <clears throat> because this poor person had no earthly resources whatsoever, because that poor person was oppressed by everyone everywhere, this poor person put his whole complete trust in Almighty God. Totally. Thus the poor man is also a humble man who has placed his whole trust in God alone. That's the person that Jesus is addressing and that Matthew describes in the grammar that he uses in the Greek of the New Testament. That's who he's describing. So this describes the poor man who has absolute destitute, nothing at all, He's poor, he's humble, he's helpless, and therefore he has no other choice but to put his whole trust in God. God is the only one who will and who can help him. So, blessed are the poor in spirit means, blessed is the man who has realized his own utter helplessness and who has put his whole trust in God alone. And, and then Jesus says, and Matthew records, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. I'm going to start for a few Sundays, and Lori, this is thanks to you. All right, so you, you rang that bell in my head when Lori played the Lord's Prayer the other Sunday on the organ. Oh, how beautiful. And I remember Jane uh, Coleman Brown singing that. Oh, how beautiful but the Lord's Prayer. Now, in the Methodist churches that we serve, and Lord, uh, uh, Pam, uh, Sam, Sam, Pam, <laughs> Pam, you remember it with your first husband before he passed away. In the Methodist church, that's part of the liturgy that the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer are recited by the entire congregation every Sunday. So here in the next little bit, in a short while, and a couple of Sundays, uh, I'm going to put the Lord's Prayer into our worship service and ask the whole church to recite it with us in unison. And I want to do that for two or three times and get our folks used to that prayer because I'm going to bring some teaching about the Lord's Prayer and sermonic form 
as well as teaching form. And I want you to understand it. Uh, and and when, when, when the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus said, <clears throat> Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, when Jesus said, Blessed is the poor in spirit, for his is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and and in your notes, on the last page of your notes, the kingdom of God is a society where God's will is perfectly done in earth as it is done in heaven. And this means that only the folks who do God's will become citizens of the kingdom of God. We can only do God's will when we realize our utter helplessness, our ignorance, our inability to save ourselves. When we understand, like you've already heard me say from the pulpit, every one of us are Adams and Eves because every single morning when we open our eyes, we have a brand new day in front of us. And if you're like me, not an hour passes after you open your eyes before you've already committed some sin of commission or omission. And when I tell folks it is almost impossible to be a true Christian, I have folks read me the right act and get so angry with me. But I don't think they've ever really paid attention to what they read in their Bibles. So Jesus, when, when we come to understand that only with the help of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God can we defeat Satan and his temptations every day. And every day we try and we try and we try to live those commandments that Jesus gave us and to keep those commandments. The very first one being love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, number one. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. And here we are with church folk, butting heads with each other, mad at each other, carrying grudges that I preached about the other Sunday morning. No, folks, no. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven with grudges in your heart. Because that word, that verb, are, is not present. It's Jesus talking about something that happens right now. And so that happens when I have forgiven everyone who has wronged me. Because in the Lord's Prayer we say, forgive us our debts, our trespasses, as we forgive. In other words, in the same exact way that we forgive everybody else. Now, if you want God to forgive you, what does that say to you? And if you've read the Lord's Prayer in your Bible, the verses follow it says, For if you do not forgive them, God can't forgive you. God won't forgive you. How powerful is that? So I had this dream one night when I was pastoring over at St. Elmo. I had this dream. And myself and my best friend, Bobby Hendricks, were walking up to the pearly gates. Now, Bobby has passed away a number of years ago. And so there I am in my dream with Bobby and I walking up to the pearly gates. And there's St. Peter. There's God ready to greet us. And I walk up there and I say, oh boy, God, I'm sure glad to see you, man. I'm ready to get on those streets and go, you know. And God says, oh, time out, hold it, digger. Slow down just a minute. Who's that walking behind you? Oh, that's my best friend, Bobby Hendricks. Yeah, yeah, I know about Bobby Hendricks. And, and I said, and God says, well, digger, I can't let you in until you go and talk with Bobby and resolve that thing that you never resolved with him. you got to forgive him for what he did to you. I said, what? <laughs> In my dream. I'm saying, what? And God, sorry, Digger, you can't come in until you forgive Bobby. <laughs> I'm going to let Bobby in. You want to come in? You, you get over there and get it right with him. And so in my dream, I'm in a standoff. And I wake up in a night sweat, just soaking wet with sweat, terrified and afraid that God's fixing to keep me the boot, and I'm going the other way. So <laughs> I certainly didn't want that. But I think what God was trying to teach me in that dream was what I'm saying to you now from the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sin just in the same way that we forgive those who sinned against us. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth in earth now, today. 
It's not some sweet by and by. We Southern Baptists are guilty. We are guilty of putting all the emphasis on getting somebody saved just so they won't go to hell. We, are saved, we get them saved from something, but we never talk about getting them saved to something. And what we're getting them saved to is the kingdom of God now on earth. Not way out yonder somewhere. Now. Now. So we have to live our Christian life today. And I know me. I don't know you, but you know you. And I know for me, it is a struggle every single day to try to be totally obedient and to be filled with love. To be filled with love. We sing the song from the old Broadman, all the way back to the Broadman fam, Lord. Make me a channel of blessing. Make me a channel, God, of your blessings to someone today. Now, today, <laughs> the kingdom of God today. And I want to just hammer this thought and hammer this thought to the church at Union Baptist Church that the kingdom of God is here now. It arrived when Jesus, presented first by Mark in his gospel, full grown. You've heard me say this again, I'm repeating. No Bethlehem, no stars, no wise men, no shepherds in the field. No, Mark has him full grown, walking by the Sea of Galilee, preaching and saying, the kingdom of God is breaking open now. Repent and believe the good news, the gospel. Now. Now. Now, so I give you Barclay's interpretation and translation of the first beatitude. I'm going to read it off the sheet. You follow with me. Oh, the bliss of the man who has realized his own utter helplessness and who has put his whole trust in God, for thus alone he can render to God that perfect obedience which will, make, which will make him a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Now, does that give you a little bit better understanding than when you first come in and read, blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And we're going to go through the first two or three like this, and then I'm going to pick up steam, and you're going to have to do some work on your own. Okay. I hope you enjoy this. I hope I'm not belaboring it too much to you. I want to thank you so much for your faithfulness, and I hope that next Wednesday night, well, next, is next Wednesday night business meeting? Yes. Okay, one week from tonight, business meeting? Yes. Okay, so we won't teach probably that night. If so, it'll be short and sweet. Uh, <clears throat> but I want you to, by then, you know, all the ladies and helpers who have had uh, quacky Wednesdays for our kids, and Pam, thanks all of you who's had a hand. All of you have supported that, either with your time or with your money in some way, shape, or form. Thank you for that, for making those children aware of the love of Almighty God. Jesus loves the little children. Uh -huh. All the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. So thank you for doing what you've done to let the little children in our community hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me, please? Our Father and our God, how we thank you so very much for every blessing that you send our way. Father, we thank you for this building where we can come and gather, this, this building we call your house. Yes. Although we know that you reside within us, that we are your temple, O oh God. Help us tonight to understand fully what it means for us to be your temple. And help us when we leave this place to walk worthy of the calling to which you have called us. May everyone we meet know that we belong to you by the love we express to them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank y'all.